Greetings, I'm Jesse with Nursery Natives, and today we're talking trees. Today's tree is the mulberry. Right now, I'm standing beneath a spectacular red mulberry here in Radford, Virginia. The mulberry tree has had a very important relationship with humans over time, from the delicious berries to the finest silk. Later on in this episode, we'll talk about the connection between the silk trade in North America and the mulberry tree. But now we're going to take a road trip to the Catawba Sustainability Center, where we're going to focus on the white mulberry. And when we return, we'll talk a little bit about the differences and the historical significance between these two different species. We'll see you there. Welcome back. We're here at the Catawba Sustainability Center and I'm standing here with the farm manager, Adam Taylor. And today we're talking trees covering the mulberry. So Adam, first of all, thanks for joining us. Thanks, great to have you. Yeah, likewise. Um, I'm wondering for you, what is your favorite part about this tree? Uh, I love the tree for the fact that it, it's fast growing. So when we plant trees in pastures, uh, we don't really want to take that out of production. So the fact that it grows fast is good for the farm. And then my absolute most favorite thing is the, is the berries themselves. I can sit here and just eat them all day long. So. <laughs> yeah, they're loaded up right now. First of June. So this is typically a good time of the year uh, for the fruits to be showing. And uh, we've been picking away, <laughs> eating as we go. Uh, so yeah, we want to talk a little bit about identification. And I think one of the first thing that jumps out when you're looking at these is the shiny nature of the leaves here. Um, they are typically not so uniform. Um, if you're finding the mulberry in the wild, you actually see quite a bit of variation uh, where some of them will be sort of mitten shaped. Some of them will be more normally shaped like this one here. Um, but, but this tree happens to have um, not so much variation as far as that goes. Now the underside is always gonna be a little bit lighter here. And this is a simple leaf arrangement. So it's out there by itself. Um, those are a few things that you would look for. It does have uh, serrated edges here. That's another way that you might identify this in the wild. Obviously these are intentionally planted here and you take some additional steps when you're doing that, especially when you're integrating that into civil pasture, uh, which Adam, I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about what civil pasture is so that our audience has a good feel for one of the things that's happening here at the Catawba Sustainability Center. Yeah, civil pasture is a, a form of agroforestry where we incorporate uh, trees and or shrubs uh, with grazing livestock. And so uh, both benefit in different ways. The livestock are benefiting from the shade that the tree, the tree gives them. Uh, so, you know, we, have, we plant them in a density where we have forage growing underneath, not a closed canopy. And so uh, the cattle or sheep or anything like that can kind of graze continuously, but still have the cool comfort of the shade while it's doing it. Now the tree actually will take any offsets from the cow as well as the manure that drops and trap it underground in the carbon cycle which they believe, you know, using a silvo pasture is, is creating like carbon neutral cattle. Uh, that is. integrative aspect where we're, you know, the ecosystem is more connected uh, yeah. based on what you're doing here. And as far as typical growing conditions, we often find the red mulberry as an understory tree. It's not too regular for it to be out in the sunshine like this. So as a result, it's, it's really spreading out here more than you might see it if you're finding this tree out in the wild. But another reason that um, Adam and, and the Catawba Sustainability Center would have selected this is to help with the riparian buffer zone. And so Adam, if you could share just a little bit about what this buffer zone is and, and why this might have been a selection for such a thing. Uh, yeah, well, where we're standing now is kind of like an upland of the riparian zone. And uh, we did this as a first line of defense of water quality uh, by using the landscape to redirect the water as it runs down to the creek. So we used the concept called key line plowing where we were able to take uh, lines of trees and plow lines um, on a two percent grade across the landscape so as water flows down instead of it going straight down into the creek it's spreading across the landscape being uptaken by these trees and then slowly flowing down to the creek um, we chose mulberry in this instance uh, because we wanted to incorporate a producing tree 
into the planting. So we're doing the environmental effect, but we also wanted to get something that might be marketable as, as like if you were a farmer adopting this. So Mulberry is a great producer. You can pick them, sell them off your farm or, or have a you pick or, or whatever. We just wanted to have multiple layers of usage, not just the tree for the tree's sake. Yeah, it's tasty in a jam and a pie. <laughs> and I actually learned here recently that the native indigenous peoples used to use the inner bark as a type of clothing that they would weave. That's, I found oh, fascinating. That's interesting. Adam, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the sustainability, the wholeness of all these different things that are occurring. Uh, yeah, basically uh, we're, we worked with Virginia Tech and we are a, a farm that acts as a living uh, learning laboratory uh, for the advancement of environmental sustainability as it relates to agriculture, forestry, and land management. Uh, so we do a number of things, mostly around agroforestry on Civo pastures, riparian buffers, non-timber forest products, nutrient credit trading. Uh, we run a small beef cattle herd doing better practices for grass finishing animals. And then we grow about anywhere from four to six acres of crops for uh, vegetables, for food access to, uh, to low income neighborhoods. So. Uh, really, really doing it all. Very yeah. integrative, uh, bringing all the pieces together. Oh, trying to make each piece work for the others and, uh, you know, trying to do it as environmentally stable as, as we can. We also are open to the public through our Catawba Greenway Trail. If you've hiked McAfee's Knob, we now have a overflow parking lot uh, for a trail that goes right through the farm that's about two and a half miles to meet the Appalachian Trail going up to McAfee's Knob. So you can get a lot of good scenery in on the farm and then hit the, the knob if that's your thing. And then uh, we're happy to have you and you can see all this yourself. I have very much enjoyed getting to talk with you about this tree. Um, I want to thank you again for, for inviting us. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. And I also hope that we can talk a little bit more about the other stuff that's happening here at the Catawba Sustainability Center. Happy to show you around. Yeah, awesome. We're about 15 minutes from downtown Roanoke. So I highly encourage you to come check this place out. Beautiful scenery here. And uh, yeah, it, it's a wonderful place to be. So come check it out. <laughs> We've just arrived back from our journey to the CSC and we're here in Bissett Park in Radford, Virginia, all the way at the end of the park beside the third shelter. Speaking of journeys, I told you we'd talk a little bit more about how silk is connected to the mulberry tree. Well, the silkworm actually exclusively eats mulberry leaves. And when the settlers arrived here from Europe in the early 1600s, they were hoping to establish the silk trade they quickly found out that the red mulberry was not as enticing to the silkworm. And so they decided to import the white mulberry and planted it abundantly. As a result, the red native species has been pushed out of an, its native habitat and actually hybridizes quite often with the white mulberry, making this a bit of a rarity for you to find in nature. Now we could take a closer look at some of the differences between the white mulberry and the red mulberry as you'll notice here, the leaf on this tree is actually much bigger than the one that we were looking at at the CSC, which is a white mulberry. This red mulberry leaf here is probably about six inches long. And you'll also notice that there's not quite the same shine, nor is it as dark of a green as the one that we're looking at at the CSC. Another thing to keep in mind when you're taking a look at the mulberry tree and analyzing the leaf shape is that while these are quite uniform here, it's also very common to see a great deal of variation where this one has multiple lobes and then the mitten shapes. There's actually only two other species that you would find here locally that have this sort of variation in the leaves. That would be the sassafras tree and the northern catalpa. Another thing we wanna take a look at that will help you tell the differences between the white mulberry and the red mulberry would be the length of the fruits. Notice how elongated these are, and these are far from mature. They'll actually become a much deeper red or even a black, and they'll get much bigger along the way as well. I hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and got to learn some things about the mulberry tree. And if you did, make sure that you like, subscribe, and share. Until next time, stay rooted, stay rad, and stay ready for more from Nursery Natives.